In this episode, we're going to revisit the OSHA ETS on vaccine mandates and or testing. And um, I hesitate to say mandate. It's, it's actually, you know, vaccines are optional and then you have to require weekly testing and, and mask wearing. So the ETS itself has generated a lot of controversy. And I have seen everything from this is unconstitutional to there's no need for it. And so we'll get, we're going to get into just that on this episode. We're going to recap what the ETS is, what OSHA is permitted to do under the Occupational Safety and Health Act, the law, right? Because it has nothing to do with the Constitution at that point. At least the ETS doesn't, that process, right? We'll get into that. And then we'll get into the varying arguments, you know, against the ETS and talk about, you know, what is probably more likely uh, than not going to happen as it relates to those cases, those claims. And so I want to be very clear up front, this episode is not political. I'm not talking about the politics. I'm talking about as a safety professional, how we get an opportunity to watch this process, to listen to what people are saying about the process. And then of course, go to where the process is written, learn about it as a safety professional. I mean, this is, you know, for you know, very few times that we get in, in public life that we as safety professionals get to take the front seat, right? And go, oh, okay, yeah, you're talking my, this is my thing now. So I've got something to say about this. So let's Let's break it down. Let's get into it because I think it's important for us as safety professionals to understand the rulemaking process, how OSHA promulgates standards. And yes, including ETS, but more importantly, the considerations OSHA has to make in determining that, you know, this was appropriate and ETS was appropriate. We're going to get into that in this episode. Before we get into today's topic, I want to remind everybody, if your business is reopening after any kind of closure due to COVID, or you've continued to remain open, but you're struggling with how to mark your facilities to ensure physical distancing and relay important information about safety and health as it relates to COVID, I want you to go visit our friends over at Mighty Line Floor Tape. Mighty Line has some great products for you to mark your floors, whether it be the stand here, the six feet distancing, or just floor tape to denote lanes of travel. They have everything you need to mark your facilities. So hit the link in the show notes, visit our friends at Mighty Line Floor Tape. They are incredible partners in safety. I can't thank them enough for their support of the podcast. Again, Mighty Line Tape for all of your floor marking needs. All right, as promised, we are going to get into this ETS. We're going to we're going to get into this in a different way. So, one I have to tell you up front, you know, I'm also recording the video for this episode and it's going to be available on the Safety Pro Podcast Community site. And because it's important, I'm going to make it available to all members, even the free side of the community, not just premium members, because it's important that as safety professionals we understand this whole process, the ETS process and what it means, right? So if you want to watch the video, I'm going to have some, you know, pull quotes pulled up from uh, various sources. I've got a video, news video from MSNBC. I'm going to, I'm going to bring out, I'm going to kind of make a case against the ETS, not because I'm against the ETS, but because I'm seeing these various you know, lawsuits being filed and things like that by different states. And, and of course, in the news, I keep hearing a very, you know, a very specific argument against the ETS. And so that's what I'm going to address. I'm, uh, I'm actually going to jump on that as an opportunity for us to explore the potential failure of the ETS and why. Okay, and that's just my professional opinion. I believe the ETS can get challenged on a very specific uh, aspect, and it's not what everybody is saying. The it's is unconstitutional. They did they pushed this out and didn't allow for um, public comment. You know that kind of stuff. 
um, the what I would call process arguments. I don't believe that you can win on a process argument, and, and we'll get into that. But first, we have to we have to recap something, and I'm going to go back to you know something that was referenced in the previous episode where I t- I broke all this down, and that is the Congressional Research Service. Now, what is the Congressional Research Service or CRS? It's interesting because. You know, that's what I'm going to reference, okay? And then that's this document. And I'll give you a link to download it, and you can use it as well. And, and you determine for yourself whether or not OSHA met this standard or not in determining the need for the ETS, okay? Now, the Congressional Research Service is a federal legislative branch agency, and it's located within the Library of Congress. It serves as um, shared staff exclusively to congressional committees and members of Congress. CRS experts assist at every stage of the legislative process, from the early considerations that precede bill drafting, through committee hearings and floor debate, to the oversight of enacted laws and various agency activities. Now, this so that's what the CRS is, right? So the CRS published this document, okay? And this document is called, I'm going to pull it up here for you, uh, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration Emergency Temporary Standards and COVID-19, updated September 13, 2021. So they break down the healthcare industry, ETS. They talk about the history of ETS. They talk about the regulatory um, action, the regulatory statutes, um, the actual laws that govern ETS, creating an ETS. All right. So the the CRS, what they basically state is, and it, and it answers specifically one objection that I have been reading and hearing about, which is OSHA can't do this. It's unconstitutional. And they didn't allow for public comment, which is required by law. Actually, no, it isn't. One, the Constitution has nothing to do with it, okay? In the ETS. I'm, again, just talking about OSHA creating an ETS. No, they, they actually can do this. Yes, OSHA's normal, the normal rulemaking process for the promulgation of standards is largely governed by the provisions of the Administrative Procedure Act, APA, and Section 6B of the OSH Act, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, okay? So, uh, yes, under APA, uh, federal agencies, including OSHA, are required to provide notice of proposed, proposed rules through the publication of a notice of proposed rulemaking in the federal register, right? And they have to provide the public a period of time to comment on the proposed rules, okay? So uh, Section 7B of the OSH Act mirrors the APA in that it requires notice and comment in the rulemaking process. After publishing a proposed standard, the public must be given a period of at least 30 days to provide comments. In addition, any person may submit written objections to the proposed standards and may request a public hearing on the standard. Here's the problem. That's under the normal rulemaking process. ETS, Emergency Temporary Standards, are not normal. Hence, they get they got their own category, Emergency Temporary Standards, okay? Section 6C of the OSHA Act provides the authority for OSHA to issue an emergency temporary standard without having to go through the normal rulemaking process. That's it. That's the first sentence is all I should read from that paragraph. Okay. That right there calls into question the argument that OSHA doesn't have the authority to do this, issue an ETS, and they they didn't allow for public comment. Don't have to. Don't have to. It says right here, OSHA may promulgate an ETS without supplying any notice or opportunity for public comment or public hearings. 
an ETS is immediately effective upon publication in the Federal Register. Upon promulgation of an ETS, OSHA is required to begin the full rulemaking process for a permanent standard with the ETS serving as the proposed standard for this rulemaking. So you begin the normal rulemaking process after the ETS is uh, published to the uh, Federal Register. Now, the argument that OSHA can't do this, I, I'm kind of reading between the lines, and that is can't issue an ETS or can't mandate employers require their employees to be vaccinated or subject to weekly tests and wearing masks. Two different conversations. So let's focus on the ETS. Now, the, the standard clearly states OSHA is able to do this. They are able to, to publish an ETS. The ETS requirements are as follows. Section 6C1 of the Occupational Safety and Health Act requires that both of the following determinations be made in order for OSHA to promulgate an ETS. Here is where the legal argument needs to focus. Not on process, not on they didn't allow for public comment. Sorry, don't have to, I just read it to you. I'm not even a lawyer and I can read that much, okay? So uh, it's not constitutional. What, an ETS isn't constitutional? Or requiring employers to require their workers to be vaccinated or sub subject to weekly tests is not constitutional. The, so it wasn't, it wasn't specific. Now, these are all public letters. Their filings might be a little different and have more specificity to it, but in general, they're public letters. They're, the you know press releases they put out did not specify. It just said, this ETS is unconstitutional. This is o government overreach. And it's, a, okay, I'm, I'm reading to you right here. And again, I'm not arguing for or against the ETS. I'm saying as a safety professional, this is really, I'm totally geeking out on this. Okay, I'm a policy wonk. I, I look at this stuff. I, I look at what can be done, can't be done. I'm shocked at stuff that does get done. <laughs> and Because uh, I'm like, I don't think that I would argue that one. Um, so here, ETS determination. Um, OSHA has to make sure that both of these determinations are made in order to promulgate the ETS. One, that employees are exposed to grave danger from exposure to substances or agents determined to be toxic or physically harmful or from new work hazards, new hazards in the workplace, and that such emergency standard is necessary to protect employees from such danger. So the term grave danger used in the first uh, determination, it's not defined in any statute or regulation. All right, the legislative history demonstrates the intent of Congress that the ETS process, quote, not be utilized to circumvent the regular standard setting process, but the history is unclear as to how Congress intended the term grave danger to be defined, right? Um, and CRS chimes in on this, the Congressional Research Service, they say, Although the federal courts have ruled on challenges to previous ETS promulgations, the courts have provided no clear guidance as to what constitutes a grave danger. And we have an example. In 1984, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit Court in Asbestos Info Association versus OSHA issued a stay and invalidated OSHA's November 1983 ETS lowering the permissible exposure limit or PEL for, uh, for asbestos in the workplace. In its decision, the court stated that gravity of danger is a policy decision committed to OSHA, not to the courts. The court, however, ultimately rejected the ETS in part on the grounds that OSHA did not provide sufficient support for its claim that 80 workers would ultimately die because of exposure to asbestos during the six month life of the ETS. So they were they failed to provide evidence 
substantiating one of the two determinations. All right, not so much the grave danger, but that there was a need for them to act, for them to do it. All right, there's also something called uh, necessity determination, um, that second part. And that's, that's what we're going to get to. Okay, we're going to get to both of these, grave danger and necessity determination. So in addition to addressing a grave danger to employees, they have to also satisfy um, or make the determination that the ETS is necessary to protect employees from that danger, right? So in the previous case, Asbestos Info Association uh, versus OSHA, the court invalidated the asbestos ETS for the additional reason that OSHA had not demonstrated the necessity. The court cited, among other factors, the duplication between the respirator requirements of the ETS and OSHA's existing standard requiring respirator use. Let me stop right there. OSHA is saying that if we need this ETS because there are no other provisions or efforts being made to address this hazard. Therefore, we have to require this. How are they going to prove that? There are a number of efforts being made across the country. Now, you can say that some, uh, some vary from state to state or city to city. Okay, that's fair. But that's not what the determinations say. Well, in part, they do say inconsistency. They're inconsistent. Okay. All right. So now we have OSHA saying we have to do this because... If we don't, they're in grave danger. Where if you look at the current guidelines from the CDC and OSHA's own website, webpage, and that the fact that most, almost all employers are addressing COVID in some way, shape, or form because their local municipalities, the local health orders are requiring them to do so. Physical distancing, masks, um, you know, uh, symptoms, checks, things like that. There are efforts underway and actually workplace, workplace related exposures have gone down. They have gone down. All right. So, so one, you know, there are efforts being made. Number one. Now, maybe there is some wiggle room here for an ETS in that you could argue they're inconsistent. But I don't think you can argue that they're non-existent, that efforts aren't, aren't even making an impact. They are making an impact. Now, now let's get to the grave danger. Grave danger. We know that if we, if we throw out anybody under 18 just for the sake of our discussion, okay, anybody under the age of 18, because the CDC says 18 and over, we have the vaccination data. At the time of this recording, we have 80% of Americans vaccinated or have had at least the first dose of anybody 18 or over. All right. Is, is this grave danger to the 18 to 25 year old group? No, statistically it's not. It's only when you get, you, you know, get past 35 or, you know, forties and into your fifties. And then of course, older, it's extremely deadly, right? But those, those individuals, you know, 65, 70 and above, they don't make up uh, even a, a slight percentage of the workforce, but 90 some 6%, what is it? CDC has on here, um, vaccinated. And, and that demographic, almost completely vaccinated already. Okay. So then we have this added layer that OSHA is saying, well, it's only going to be employers that have 100 or more employees. Okay. Well, those are bigger employers with large, you know, groups of people. They are already making efforts to address this issue. In the ETS, the, in the hundreds of pages of ETS, there's all kinds of studies they point to. And I, I, I've read most of it uh, up to this point. I've still got a little ways to go, but I noticed they mentioned the meatpacking industry because that was that hit the news. Everyone knows that. They got hit early on really bad, right? What about now? What about now? Is there a grave danger? So grave danger, that's, that's the problem. 
if you look at fatalities, you look at the CDC chart at this time in November, deaths are down. We're on a downslope. It's not even heading upwards, okay? We're on a downslope. It's actually lower than it was at the beginning of the year. And now, if this, if this was that grave of a danger, why not in January? Look at the chart. Now, if you're not on video or if you're on audio out there in podcast land, you can't see this chart, but it's a lot higher than this last uh, Delta spike. And the Delta, this last Delta spike in the summer was all in the Southern states because it's seasonal. You're going to see a spike in the Northern states as well. Nowhere near the spike we had at the beginning of the year. Why not then? Why wasn't it a grave danger then? Death rates, hospitalization rates, much higher back then. Much lower now. All right, so you have that. Then you have the just the numbers portion of this. If 80% of the, the citizens in our country, not just workers, all citizens, 18 and over, are vaccinated, okay? What percent of them are left and what percent of them work for companies of 100 and more employees? I, I So, I, I mean, I'm kind of looking at this going, you know, what are we, what's our net effect? What are we hoping to net here with an ETS? What are we trying to do? Add this to the fact that the Secretary of Labor himself said on MSNBC, he made this statement, the following statement, I'm gonna play this clip, give it a listen. D does the does Department of Labor have the, you know, the capacity to, to enforce this, to make sure this actually happens? Yeah, well, yes, well, we, I mean, the Department of Labor and OSHA in sp particularly has done uh, work like this over the last 50 years. So they certainly have the capacity. Uh, for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be working with uh, companies and getting the information. Quite honestly, I think a lot of the companies already uh, with 100 or more employees already have some type of vaccine yeah. program. And, and a lot of times it's a mandate. Uh, this isn't a mandate. This is a vaccine or testing. And I think that, that that's something that a lot of the people who are anti-vaccine and saying they don't want it, I want you to take a take a deep breath and, and hear what I'm saying here because I think it's really important to understand it is about keeping people safe, including folks that don't want to get vaccinated, to make sure that they're safe. All right. Well, there you go. The Secretary of Labor himself, after the ETS was, was you know, what, Thursday? This was Thursday? Last Thursday? After the ETS hit the streets, if you will, um, as unpublished, by the way, on, on the Thursday it was released, the Secretary of Labor goes out and makes that statement. In case you didn't notice, he says, most large employers already have vaccine programs in place, many of which are mandates, meaning you have to get vaccinated or you're, you're fired. Okay, so did he just effectively remove the necessity to do this, the second determination OSHA has to make for an ETS by, by saying, wait a minute, the vast majority, uh, most, right, large employers already have vaccine programs, many of which are mandates. So I think that's where the argument lies. If you look at the process, OSHA can issue an ETS. Under the law, they have to make these two determinations. The When they make these two determinations and they publish an ETS, they do not need to give advance notice under the law, and they do not need to allow for public comment under the law. But as soon as the ETS hits the Federal Register, the clock starts ticking where they now have to begin the formal rulemaking process where they do have to give advance notice and they do have to allow for public comment. Here's the other problem with an ETS. As it's written now, the ETS is a stopgap measure. The expectation, actually not expectation, the requirement under the law is that OSHA then replace the ETS with a permanent standard within six months of publishing the ETS, right? 
An ETS must include a statement of reasons for the action in the same manner as required for a permanent standard. So I, I don't feel like going forward, a permanent, co a permanent vaccine requirement or weekly COVID testing and mask wearing, how is that going to survive past six months and into the future? How are you going to write a permanent standard requiring this to be done? What, what we're, going to, we're going to be doing this for the next 30, 40 years? Add this to the fact that the length of time it typically takes, it's years to get a standard promulgated. So I, there is no way OSHA is going to be able to replace this ETS with a permanent standard using the ETS as a proposed standard in this case, um, in six months, it's not going to happen. All right. So you have, so you have the, those issues working against this ETS. So what about the healthcare ETS you say? Well, the healthcare industry, the reason why it, if, if you want to say it this way, it made sense for the healthcare industry, their job was to receive these COVID patients and treat them. It was a, it was their, that's their workplace, right? So I go to the department store and I work at the department store and OSHA says, you're in grave danger. You need to be vaccinated or you need to wear a mask and subject yourself to weekly testing, um, of which your employer does not have to pay for under this ETS and uh, nor your time away to, to go get tested, but you have to produce every seven days a negative COVID test and wear a mask when around others. And you work in a department store. Here in my local city, right nearby, actually I should say it's a city over, a big city, they just rescinded the public health order requiring masks inside businesses because of the drop in cases. So now we're telling the employees, you're in such grave danger. And OSHA had to do this to protect you, to keep you from, protect you from that grave danger. But yet everybody that walks into this department store doesn't have to wear a mask. We don't know if they're vaccinated. There's just no way the logic will hold in this case, okay, when you're, especially when you're dealing with the public. So OSHA says in the workplace, you are, you are in such grave danger. We have to do this, but your workplace involves interacting with the public. They don't have to, the, the local health orders are like, yeah, no, we're the, we, our vaccination rates are such that it's statistically unlikely that you're going to spread it. Um, and, and our case rates down so much you don't have to, we don't care, you know, just go into the store, go into the department store, go into the grocery store. Uh, the workers in there, however, they're going to be subject to all kinds of stuff. You know, I, it, that's the argument, I think. So as a safety professional, just looking at the, the rulemaking process, looking at the merits of the ETS, I can see more of an argument that one, you can't prove there's a grave danger, grave danger, right? And you got, you've got case history uh, for this, um, how Congress, you know, turned, coined that phrase and, and what some, some cases have, have taken place in the past. And then, of course, that such emergency standard is necessary to protect employees from danger because no other efforts are being made, right? That's the necessity determination. It's it's clear we have other efforts being made. So, I you know the rule when we look at the rulemaking process, it's really really interesting seeing some public attorneys, by the way, saying it's unconstitutional. OSHA can't do this, and they didn't allow for public hearing or public comment when uh, before issuing this ETS. One, that's wrong. That's wrong. I think the better argument. And I'm not arguing for or against it. I'm just looking at it the way it's written and how it came out. 
And that gets us to the political piece. I, I told you this isn't a political episode and it's not going to be. But as a safety professional, it's interesting, no matter which party we're talking about, by the way, no matter which special interest group is, is doing this, by the way, you, we have to recognize that OSHA can be influenced by like a special interest group can petition OSHA to review a, a hazard and to, they don't have to, OSHA doesn't have to respond. Okay. Um, but there, there is influence that can be placed on the administration to do things like this. And then they do them and by and large, st statistically speaking, they do not get passed. So, um, it's, it's very important to look at this, the whole ETS process. Okay. The, the entire ETS process. So I think that if we look at all the ETSs that have been published, okay. Um, two, um, let, let me check myself on the math here. I believe two have actually been been upheld out of the 10. This would make, would this be the 11th or the 10th? I'm trying to remember it. I'm trying to do my, my math. All right, here's where it is. OSHA has issued ETS authority sparingly in its history and not since the asbestos ETS promulgated in 1983. So the last one they put out before the healthcare ETS was in 1983. In the nine times OSHA has issued an ETS, the courts have fully vacated or stayed the ETS in four cases, partially vacated the ETS in one case. Of the five cases that were not challenged or that were fully or partially upheld by the courts, OSHA issued a permanent standard either within six months or required um, that was required uh, or the or within, do, 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 do. yeah, okay. So either within six months required or within several months of the six month period. Okay, so OSHA has not a good track record with this. So of remember, of the five cases, they, they just went ahead and went through the normal rulemaking process. So it, it didn't matter. But um, yeah, that's not a great track record. So, um, and it looks like each of these cases, however, do, 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 OSHA did not attempt to extend the ETS. So OSHA has not attempted to extend ETS expiration in any of these cases, but they, um, for the most part, occurred before 1980, um, which some laws changed after that that made rulemaking process a lot longer. So that's why I don't think they can effectively meet the six month period. They would have to file for an extension in this case. But the healthcare ETS, they have to replace the healthcare ETS with a permanent one in, within six months of pushing out the ETS to the Federal Register. So, look, I, I think what we have here is a case of, yes, OSHA can promulgate an ETS. They have the authority to do so. They have to make those de two determinations. The ETS does not have to follow the standard you know, rulemaking process. It does not period. So I think any challenge isn't on process. It's on the merits of the ETS. Did they meet those two determinations that we covered? I would say just me looking at it in my professional opinion, I would say they have not. Certainly the grave danger is questionable, but certainly on the the second one where, okay, OSHA has to do something because no, there essentially is nothing else being done to address it. They're going to lose on that one. And I think states, almost half the states in the country have actually mobilized and made that move towards uh, objecting to this. So because of the efforts they're making, um, and I, so I think a lot of the data that's available currently and a lot of the case studies and the references to studies about how, how sick you get and how deadly this is. I think those were all cherry picked and those were all from the beginning of the pandemic. Like when we didn't have treatment options, we were still putting people on ventilators um, and we didn't have the vaccine. 
But if you look at today, it's a lot lower, a lot lower today. So it's a whole different ball game when you look at today's uh, numbers, today's cases, uh, things like that. So I, I do think that there is some hay to make with we have vaccines and now, now we are in the U.S. anyway. Uh, they already approved it in the U.K. Uh, in the U.S., now we have a COVID-19 pill. Now we have treatment that, uh, that will effectively reduce hospitalization or death by 90 some percent, like 91% or 90%, essentially just almost the same as a vaccine. So couple, those two coupled together, tell me where the, where the grave danger is. So I think there is an argument to be made and just looking at this as a case study for us as safety professionals, it's very interesting. Like how we, how we rank risk and how we look at uh, grave danger, how we define grave danger and, and you know, how public health policy, and, and you, you may have heard it, people in my inner circles, people on the community side have, have seen my videos on this and have seen me, heard me talk about this, is that, you know, you can't manage by the exception with public health policy. Um, and this gets outside of workplace safety r rules and regulations. Um, I'm talking about public health policy, but if you if you're saying our policy is until there are no more cases that's never going to happen it's not realistic and so what you end up doing is you end up bludgeoning everybody with policy to net something that you're never going to achieve realistically so anyway that's my take um, I think it's an important conversation for us to have to understand the process by which OSHA goes about promulgating standards, certainly the ETS, and whether or not they met these two requirements. It's interesting, the judge that stayed the ETS until pending further review, I'm wondering how much of this information will be brought to present to the judicial review because just on process alone, I think it's the weakest argument you can make. Well, OSHA didn't allow for public comment. Well, they don't have to for the ETS. And when they hit the federal register on that Friday, that started the clock and they've notified everybody. And guess what they're doing? They're opening up for public comments and they, you can hold hearings for the permanent standard. So in order to kick out the ETS, uh, oh, and by the way, the ETS normally would stay in effect during that public hearing and comment period and, and stuff. So in order for for this to be vacated altogether, I think the biggest argument, uh, the most solid argument is with those two determinations. Did OSHA make those two determinations convincingly? I don't know. I, don't, I think it's it's more weak than it is strong, in my opinion, at this point, reading the case studies they've uh, they've chosen. And of course, uh, the assumption that they have to do this because nobody else is doing anything. So that's my take. What do you think? Head on over to the Safety Pro Podcast community and drop your comments. Think about becoming a member. Use code FREE30 for 30 days of premium membership. Otherwise, I will talk to you on the next Safety Pro Podcast.